Um, there are all sorts of problems with trans people and healthcare. Um, we don't want you to feel that you've been singled out as sexual health services because you absolutely haven't. What we've decided is, as we all know and love, um, the NHS is a very big thing and dealing with the NHS as a whole is a huge, huge task to undertake. Uh, as trans people, we, we are in, uh, we're in a really difficult situation. I'm sure Oliver and Ruth will touch on this a bit later on if the climate around when we put the, um, when we took the information for the survey and for the report, but uh, suffice it to say that things have not really improved a great deal for trans people in accessing healthcare. Um, services were struggling before um, before COVID, and I don't have to tell anybody here that COVID has absolutely decimated specialised services and gender services and other services for trans people have been massively hit by this. We're now looking at a community that in some cases three and a half years for a first appointment, which is a huge amount of time and very little support or uh, anything in that time. Having been in that position, um, we get up to all sorts of risky behaviours, seeking validation when we're not getting the support that we need and the things that we're looking for. And we're in a situation now where I am sure that this is happening. Um, why I think sexual health services are so important, I don't know how much people have been following or do follow trans issues, but it, it shames me to say that Scotland is actually behind the rest of the UK now in the way it delivers services for trans people. Again, this is something I'm sure Oliver is going to speak about uh, later on and of course something that can be up in the Q&A, but um, there are lots of exciting things going on. Uh, in the rest of the UK with trans healthcare, and I believe and we believe at Scottish Trans that these things can be incorporated. We can take ideas from uh, other places and do better things to support our community here. So this is why, you know, we are not a specialist organisation in anything. We look for support in other organisations and we look for expertise in other in other. Um, in other organisations. And this is why it was an absolute pleasure to work with Waverley Care on this project. Their whole teams, not just Oliver and Ruth, but all the behind the scenes people gave us access to a group that we, we wouldn't normally have access to, and they understand the sector much better than we do. So um, I'm not gonna bang on for much longer. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I hope you find this really interesting. We are always interested in talking to anybody who is looking to support and help the trans community. And we would love to hear from any and all of you. Uh, and I will be free to answer questions uh, afterwards. But without more waffle from me, I'm gonna hand you over to Ruth and Oliver who are gonna talk about the project. So thank you. Thanks, Ocean. I'm going to talk a bit about the background to the project and about the structure of the project itself. Um, and then I'll hand over to Ruth to talk a bit more about the findings. Um, so this was obviously research conducted within a country with a free point of use health system, the NHS. Um, so we looked a bit at quite a lot of the different um, papers around the um, issue of trans and including non-binary people um, accessing sexual health services um, and our project itself uh, if you want to go on to the next slide Ruth, um, was uh, a collaboration between uh, Scottish Trans Alliance and Waverly Care um, kind of discussions began in 2018 um, around the issues faced facing uh, trans and including non-binary people um, and sexual health service access we recognised there was a lack of uh, literature around this and evidence um, in sexual health needs, especially in Scotland. Um, there's been some data in from Public Health England um, that shows uh, 152 trans people accessed HIV care in 2018. Of 152, 128 were tran trans women, less than 30 were trans men and less than five um, identified in another way. Um, there are some global statistics, but given that we have a free point of use health system, it's quite hard to accurately estimate whether this um, 
statistic is applicable. We estimate this is less um, applicable to the UK, given the um, health system that we have. Um, it may well be lower in the UK than internationally, but we don't know for sure as we don't have census data. Um, we don't collect census data on the trans population in the UK. Um, we know that trans people face a range of barriers to engaging with sexual health services, including, apologies for any noise, it's my puppy, um, including fear, a lack of trans competent care, discrimination, and um, we know trans people generally have greater anxiety and difficulty accessing sexual health services than their cis counterparts um, due to worry, anxiety or embarrassment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about PrEP. Um, the research that we had around PrEP and trans and non-binary people uh, was that um, there's a low awareness of, trep, of PrEP among trans respondents um, in a Hibbert et al. and Walton et al. research, um, which is detailed more in the report. The report. Um, we know we want. Uh, we know that we need more research and further guidance around PrEP use and efficacy in. Um, trans people, especially trans men, um, taking into account factors like vaginal atrophy during testosterone therapy, um, interactions between PrEP and hormonal therapies, um, and the needs of trans men who receive uh, va receptive vaginal sex as well as uh, receptive anal sex. Um, we know that uh, trans men and women are explicitly mentioned in the NHS PrEP criteria here in Scotland. Um, and we know trans people are a higher risk of acquiring HIV. Um, however, the uptake of um, PrEP it, among trans people in Scotland is really, really low, like abysmally low. Um, of 3,354 3, people who were prescribed PrEP between the 1st of July in 2017 and the 30th of June 2019, 17 trans people had, uh, had taken up PrEP. Um, so th this clearly shows that there was a need for some more research and looking into what kind of barriers there are in accessing um, sexual health services. One of the other things that we can clearly recognise is the um, that trans people are more likely to experience forms of vulnerability and marginalisation, such as high alcohol and drug use, um, intimate partner violence and uh, poor men poorer mental health. And this is some research in various forms, but Scottish Trans Alliance, one of them. Um, one of the other things that is worth bearing in mind um, with this research was the context politically and socially it was conducted within. Um, so here I'm talking about transphobia and the Gender Recognition Act. A lot of the time in, in the research, participants were citing transphobia as an issue, especially when accessing services and influencing their engagement. And it has to be mentioned that uh, people's people's perception of public services when the government are not necessarily supporting trans legal rights um, can definitely have an impact on whether they want to engage with public services or not. Um, so yeah, bear in mind the often hostile context that this was uh, taking place in. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, Ruth. Um, so our research question was, what are the barriers and facilitators to trans people accessing sexual health services in Scotland? And when we say trans people, we include non-binary people here. Um, it was a peer-led project with trans and cis researchers, uh, peer-led meaning that it was run by people who had personal experience of the topic under investigation, including um, directly, direct, <laughs> let me start that again people who have personal experience of the topic under investigation and are directly and equally involved in the design and delivery of the research. So trans people and cis people. Um, the first stage of this research was uh, a survey which was incentivized by a prize draw of three £50 vouchers. Um, it was promoted in a Pride events last year back when they were a thing and um, ran between April and August last year. We received 289 valid responses after data cleaning. Um, it was a convenient sample, but it was also the largest, largest survey with trans people in Scotland, um, which was quite an achievement. Um, the second stage was focus groups um, and interviews in September, 2019. Um, 28 people participated in these, some an additional 
participant took part in an interview and some participants wished for a further interview to discuss topics they didn't feel comfortable or wanted to elaborate on further outside of the group context. Um, we uh, paid for the travel expenses and provided food and refreshments and paid participants for their time to reduce the likelihood of any financial barriers that might mean some people can't take part. Um, so access was also a key um, thought around um, these focus groups and that we provided um, clearly signed or gender neutral toilets, um, a quiet room and varied methods of engagement, such as like open discussion, scribing, uh, post-it notes to share how participants felt about accessing services and visual mapping exercise to explore what participants ideal sexual health service might look like. Um, the third stage was NHS staff um, interviews. Um, we interviewed eight members from NHS Glasgow, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, um, some past staff from NHS Lothian and some from NHS Highland to, in, to ensure a diversity of perspectives. Um, uh, the interviews explored practitioners' knowledge and confidence delivering services to trans people. We also considered um, the ethics uh, around the power dynamics when you're um, when you're engaging with marginalised groups, um, and part of this was the peer-led approach, as well as um, making sure people were financially invested for their time when taking part. Um, now I am going to hand over to Ruth to talk a bit more about the findings. Thanks, Oliver. Um, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Ruth McKenna. I'm the Senior Research Communications Manager at Waverley Care. Um, I think someone mentioned this at the start, but Waverley Care is a, a sexual health and bloodborne virus organisation working in Scotland. Um, and I was one of the, the researchers who worked alongside Oliver and Oceana on this project. Um, so just to explain a bit more about the findings, I'll kind of go through the, the survey findings briefly and then um, our qualitative findings and then finally talk a bit about our recommendations. I should say that the, the presentation is a kind of whistle stop tour of the finding. There's a lot more um, in, in our final report. Um, so in terms of the, the survey findings, just to give a bit of general demographic information, around 60% of our respondents were based in the central belt of Scotland, just for people that, I know we've got an international audience, so um, that's the kind of most populous centre of the country, incorporates Glasgow and Edinburgh and, and various um, surrounding areas. Uh, and that sort of level of engagement from the central belt broadly corresponds to the numbers of the Scottish population who are based in the central belt. So it was relatively um, geographically representative in terms of the population of Scotland. It was very much a young sample, so 75% of people who we spoke to were aged between 18 and 34. Um, and you can see the gender breakdown on the slide. So we had a reasonably balanced breakdown in the survey. I should say that in the qualitative findings, trans women were, were definitely underrepresented. So that's a kind of a limitation of, of the research that we should highlight early on. In terms of people's general experiences of accessing sexual health services in Scotland, um, so approximately 40% of the people who responded to the survey had visited a sexual health clinic in the last two years. So that's specifically engaging with an, an NHS sexual health clinic rather than, for example, visiting their GP um, to talk about a sexual health issue. In general, 60% of the people who responded reported positive experiences of engaging with services. But what we found is when we broke those findings down by gender, that there were kind of different experiences for different populations. Um, and in particular, our non-binary participants talked um, more about experiences of being misgendered um, or being offered tests or treatment that were inappropriate for their anatomy. Um, there were lots of areas identified for improvement in the survey, but one of the really key things, as, as Oliver's kind of touched upon already, was around access to PrEP. Um, so I'm sure this is, you know, something that everybody here knows, but PrEP is a, a medication that somebody who is HIV negative can take to stop them contracting uh, HIV through sex. Um, and one of the key issues around PrEP that was identified was particularly, again, from our non-binary participants, um, People may not be familiar with the way PrEP is administered via the NHS in Scotland, um, but there's a kind of specific criteria which is largely articulated in gendered terms. So it talks about 
um, men, women. It is inclusive of trans men and trans women, but it talks about the individual and their partners in terms of gender. Um, so for non-binary people trying to understand if PrEP might be right for them or not, it's, it's really difficult to understand because it's not kind of articulated with reference to people's anatomy or types of sex. Um, rather, you know, kind of gender and, and sexual orientation and different sexual behaviours are, are used uh, to describe eligibility instead. So that was a, a real area of where um, our non-binary survey respondents in particular felt they needed to be more clarity to, to enable non-binary access to PrEP. Um, in terms of our qualitative findings, so as Oliver said, we did four focus groups interviews. We had a massive amount of qualitative data um, by the end of the project. And basically we used the, the sort of adapted socio-ecological model um, that's set out on the slide to help us organize and understand that qualitative data. Um, and we kind of used an overarching barriers facilitators um, approach to sort of categorize the data and to do that at each of these levels of the model. So firstly, looking at the individual, so things like a person's sort of motivations, feelings, knowledge, um, then looking at the social level, so people's friendship groups, peer support, um, community generated knowledge, the role of the community in, in potentially sexual health service delivery. We looked at the organisational level, so that was primarily the NHS um, as, as being the kind of sexual health service that the vast majority of our participants had engaged with. But the way services are delivered in Scotland, some community based services are have contracted out to third sector or charitable organisations like um, We Really Care. Um, so there's some, some elements of the organisational findings that are relevant to sort of charitable or community organisations who deliver specific types of sexual health services, usual, usually things like testing um, or awareness raising. Um, and finally, we looked at the policy level. So again, Oliver's kind of touched on that, but that was particularly around um, at the time we were doing the research, both the UK and Scottish governments were consulting on reform of the Gender Recognition Act in Scotland, um, and that created a particular sort of public media, um, political, really hostile environment around um, any trans related issues. Um, and so that's something that, that we kind of touch on in the research at that policy level. Um, so just to go through the findings um, before I sort of move on to the recommendations. So at the individual level, one of the key barriers that, that we came across was, was fear. Um, and that's something Oliver mentioned already that, and Oceana actually in, in their introduction that, you know, many trans people have very negative experiences of engaging with health services, whether that be sexual health services or, or other services. Um, and so that level of fear of accessing services could um, operate to, to prevent people from engaging with, with sexual health services at all. Um, what we found for some people was that they had maybe been to sexual health services once, but then had such a difficult experience that they didn't want to engage again. Whereas for others, um, they had never been at all, even though, you know, they reported um, potentially being at risk, potentially needing tested, but the level of fear that they felt about engaging was so significant um, that they felt the harm that would be caused to their mental health was, was um, more significant than the harm that would potentially result from not um, you know, accessing a test when that was needed. Um, the individual's ability or access to knowledge to enable them to assess sexual health related risks was a factor. So I touched on that in relation to kind of non-binary people's experiences of accessing PrEP. Um, because people had very little uh, access to relevant and tailored information about trans sexual health, what we found is that many of our participants didn't actually have the information available to assess their risk factors because sexual health information was often delivered with reference to gender. Um, people weren't sure if the particular types of sex they were having, the body parts they were using meant that they were at higher risk of HIV or other STIs or not. Um, so that kind of overlaps obviously with, with different layers of, of the model, particularly the organisational layer and, and sort of making sure that people have access to the right information. But at that individual level, it, it certainly played a role in whether people had the, the ability and the knowledge to assess um, when they should be engaging and engaging with services and potentially getting a test. Um, at the social community level, we found that support from family and friends could be a massive facilitator to engaging with services. So um, if people were encouraged by their family and friends to engage um, and potentially got peer support to actually go to appointments, that could play a really significant role. 
Um, people always also talked about the important role of the community in sort of generating sexual health information. So for many people, um, like YouTube channels, Facebook groups were the only source of information they had about tailored sort of tailored information about transsexual health. Um, and so many people wanted to see the community continue to play a role in sort of sexual health service delivery and sexual health information provision, but to have some legitimacy conveyed on that. So whether that was um, trans people working within NHS sexual health services uh, or within community based sexual health services so that people could both get the benefit of accessing information from the community, but also know that the information they were accessing was kind of valid um, and, and correct, I suppose. At the organisational level, there was absolutely loads in there, so I, I can't kind of cover it all. Um, but the main things were around accessibility and inclusion. So making sure that um, sexual health clinics were physically accessible. Um, things like trying to ensure that the clinics and practitioners were trauma informed where possible. Um, pretty basic stuff that would make services actually, you know, kind of more inclusive for all. It's not just relevant to, to the trans population. Um, in terms of data sharing, that's something that's probably quite specific to the Scottish context, I think, given the way in which gender identity services and sexual health services are structured. So for the most part in Scotland, um, gender identity clinics are part of sexual health services, um, at least in three of the main health boards that deliver uh, gender identity clinics. And what that means is that both gender identity clinics and wider sexual health services use the same patient electronic monitoring system which no other service in the NHS has access to. So it's quite a niche, it's quite a specific barrier, um, I think, to the context that we operate in. But because people knew that their sexual health practitioner and perhaps the clinician they were seeing at the gender identity clinic both had access to the same information, um, that could operate as a barrier where people you know, just didn't necessarily want that information to be shared across these sort of different strands of services. Um, Another kind of barrier or facility, you know, depending on, on the balance, a barrier or facility, there could be levels of practitioner training and knowledge. So if practitioners had, um, the fact that many practitioners didn't have training in firstly sort of issues relating to trans and um, non-binary gender identities, but also a sort of specific point around practitioner knowledge of um, trans and non-binary sexual health needs specifically. So Oliver mentioned a bit about that at the start around Sort of knowledge around pre prescribing for trans men, um, there was stuff around um, condom provision for trans men as well, um, gamete storage, so some, some specific kind of sexual reproductive health related issues that if practitioners were well informed about could, could really facilitate people to engage and likewise if they weren't that could be a barrier. Um, what people did highlight is that they certainly didn't expect practitioners to be experts in everything um, and so if a practitioner didn't know something, then a real uh, kind of facilitator to engage could be if that person was willing to go away and sort of do the research themselves, read up um, and, and inform themselves rather than expecting the patient to sort of go away and, and do that research instead. Um, information provision, I kind of touched on that, but that's just kind of people wanted to ensure or wanted services to ensure that when information was delivered, and so far as is possible, that was done so with reference to bodily anatomy and different types of sexual behaviour rather than um, talking about gender identities and kind of using that as code for different types of sex. Um, at the policy level, obviously, we've mentioned that the kind of transphobia and the wider political debate around reforming the um, Gender Recognition Act played a significant role. Um, some participants also talked about in a programme of austerity that's, that's been underway in, in the UK for the last decade and the impact that that had had on things like waiting times and capacity within sexual health services. Um, just to touch on the practitioner perspective, so as Oliver said, we also interviewed practitioners working in sexual health services. By and large, everybody we spoke to really wanted to deliver good care to trans um, patients and wanted people to access services and come away having had a positive, respectful experience. Um, However, most of the practitioners we spoke to did recognise that there were limitations in their knowledge of both trans identities and then also specifically um, trans sexual health needs. And that was something that they wanted to um, learn more about through, through further training. So in terms of our recommendations, um, I'll not talk through all of these. I'll just kind of highlight some of the most important ones. So um, our, in terms of the kind of policy level, 
um, health care is devolved in Scotland, so our recommendations were primarily to the Scottish Government, um, both around making sure that trans uh, access to sexual health services is embedded in the Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Framework, which is the kind of policy framework that um, covers, covers sexual health uh, and HIV in Scotland. Um, and then the next two recommendations are kind of related to that wider issue of, of the Gender Recognition Act and ensuring that trans people kind of rights in terms of equalities are continue to be upheld in Scotland um, because we recognise that the sort of impact that um, the kind of transphobic political debate has had on trans people's access to a whole load of public services but particularly health services um, and given how sensitive kind of sexual health services are we think there's a, a really kind of profound impact in, in that regard so um, focus for most of those uh, recommendations on actually just kind of the wider policy environment as it relates to trans rights and, and trans identities in Scotland. Um, for NHS health services we've got sort of lots of recommendations that are broken down into different uh, categories so in terms of service design it th it's things like making sure services are as, as gender neutral as possible um, and that includes asking uh, patients about gender in a trans inclusive way um, as I mentioned, making sure that sexual health information is by and large communicated uh, with reference to anatomy and, and kinds of sex. Um, and also some kind of general points around kind of public commitments to equality and, and making sure that people know how to complain and know how to give feedback. That one at the bottom about maintaining transparency around accessing services using a pseudonym relates specifically to that issue I talked about earlier with the kind of electronic monitoring system that sexual health services and therefore gender identity services in Scotland use um, and it is an option for people to access services using a pretend name so just making sure that people know they have that option if they want to keep their sort of wider sexual health uh, electronic record separate from their gender identity clinic record. Training and staffing needs, this was something that came from both the practitioners we interviewed and also the uh, trans participants that we spoke to so making sure staff have access to wider quality and diversity training, as well as specific training um, around the clinical needs of trans patients. Um, we also highlighted need for additional training around things like trauma-informed care and neurodiversity and the needs of sex workers. Um, and that specifically relates to the point Oliver made at the start where, you know, we know from evidence that trans people are more likely to be affected by a whole, a whole host of other um, issues uh, and, and therefore you know we need to make sure that that uh, sexual health care is trauma informed and actually that you know as with quite a lot of our recommendations that would be to the benefit of the general population not not just the trans population um, and finally exploring employment options for trans staff to deliver either clinical or non-clinical roles and services um, there's some specific sort of clinical recommendations here about what um, practitioners should do just as part of, of routine practice um, and these very much align with existing recommendations around delivering integrated sexual health services so sexual health services where their services are delivered to trans people within the general sexual health service provision rather than having a, a tailored service for um, just trans patients um, so making sure that practitioners are asking about people's names and pronouns as part of routine inquiry not making assumptions about a person's gender or sexual activity, um, being transparent about how electronic monitoring is used, um, familiarising themselves with relevant clinical guidance around um, sort of PrEP prescribing, PET prescribing, vaccinations, contraception, etc. for for trans people. Um, and this is a, the kind of recommendation around GMC guidance on intimate examinations is just to make sure that people are allowed a friend or partner or family member into an intimate examination with them if that's something they want because there is sort of express guidance around how that situation should be handled. Um, so next set of recommendations is kind of for third sector health uh, sexual health and bloodborne virus organisations so I mentioned at the start that in Scotland some sexual health services are delivered by organisations like Waverly Care and, and other organisations um, like Terence Higgins Trust. Um, so for organisations delivering sexual health out with the kind of NHS framework um, the recommendations are around sort of working in partnership with trans advocacy organisations to deliver bloodborne virus and sexual health outreach and testing, um, delivering sexual health information, 
um, seeking funding for and producing bespoke sexual health information resources for trans people on kind of high priority topics like PrEP and HIV prevention. Um, and just generally ensuring that all, all of our work and all of the information resources that we're putting out are trans inclusive. So as we recommended for NHS services, that they're communicated with reference to body parts and types of sex rather than gender and sexual orientation. Um, final uh, recommendations are for trans advocacy organisations like, like Scottish Trans Alliance. Um, so again, it's about just continuing to work in partnership with sexual health and bloodborne virus organisations, um, seeking funding for and delivering training around sort of trans inclusive service delivery um, and, and continuing to work in partnership with the NHS and with charitable sexual health and bloodborne virus uh, organisations to provide sexual health advocacy and, and peer support to trans people. Um, so that's us. Thank, thanks very much for listening to that. Um, and we're very happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Ruth. Um, I wanted to, so we've got two questions uh, coming through just now. So this one I'll open up to um, whoever feels uh, most able to speak about it. Um, anonymous question says, asks that, do you have any idea of how many people in Scotland are accessing gender identity clinics? I feel that sadly the trans community is often hidden and lacks inclusion due to ignorance. I know that some schools do fantastic work, but it would be good to have an estimated number uh, so we can speak openly in schools and educate them on how to be more inclusive. I'll go to Oceana for that one, I think. Yes, hi. Uh, okay, unfortunately, I have these numbers etched on my brain at the moment. So uh, 2,123 people waiting more than 2 million days some of the gender clinics have got three and a half waiting, three and a half year waiting lists now, um, and the waiting lists are going up, not down. Um, this comes to back what I was saying before: service services were failing to keep up uh, back as far as 2016. Um, COVID has has just made this ten times worse. So instead of progressing with waiting lists, the waiting lists are just getting longer. People are losing hope. There are no services for trans people who are on the waiting lists. Again, these are things that, that we touch on in this report, but they are equally applicable to uh, gender services. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, I, I have thought of about a million ways I could discuss this subject. Um, but we can't really sugarcoat what is going on at the moment. The hostile, the hostile environment that we were living in back in 2019 has not improved. If anything, it's got worse. Oliver was absolutely right when they said that um, just the level of uh, media attention, negative media attention the trans community has been receiving does have a knock-on effect on services, on how people treat us, on how people think about us. Um, and unfortunately, we do not have the resources or reach that um, that lots of our uh, detractors do. And um, I mean, I want I don't want this all to be a complete negative. All I will say is, you know, how we are recognised and how we are, you know, in a situation like this, this is about looking after people. This is about doing the best we can for individuals, whether they are trans or whatever else they are. So, how we are recognised and how we are seen by law or society as a, in a wider context should not actually impact what we do. Trans people are always going to be here, whatever we call ourselves and whatever we've had to do to. Um, navigate society uh, we're still going to be here and we're still going to have these same problems so um we we are still here we've been here yes now is not great i think it will get better lgbt youth obviously have some really good stuff about schools guidance um there is material out there uh, obviously we have stuff we have resources on our web page um, but i'm not going to deny that now is a very difficult time um, but we're doing all we can. I hope that answers the question. I do ramble. I'm sorry. Thanks, Ashana. I'm I'm sure it did. Um, so we've got another question here from uh, Jimmy from THT Scotland, uh, who says thank you for a very good session. Um, 
At THT Scotland and Men Only Tayside, we really encourage trans and non-binary people to use our services, especially our testing services, but we see few trans people face to face. How can we encourage more trans and non-binary people to use our services? And I wonder if Oliver would like to answer that one. Yeah, I'm just trying to scroll to the report part where we've got third sector recommendations. Because in the in the report it has uh, we have third sector organisation recommendations specifically to say what you can do um, to encourage like engaging with encourage engagement from trans and non-binary people. I think, I mean, even it like even the name men only Tayside, you're going to be like immediately any non-binary person will see that and go, oh, so that's not for me. So like, there's a start, I'd, like think about who you want to engage. Um, and then you yeah, have a read of the report. Ruth, do you have any more words? <laughs> what do you think? Um, so let me just refer back to the question. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's plenty in the report that could maybe kind of help with that. I think as, Oliver said, thinking about the naming, perhaps particularly for non-binary um, people, is is maybe worth considering. I mean, I don't know in terms of the kind of marketing material that's used. If on that, it's kind of explicit that that um, you know, kind of men only is inclusive of trans men and non-binary people. And so I think that would. I don't know if you'd agree, Oliver. That would probably be the first step. Just in obviously any external um, publicity and marketing. Again, I'm not sure exactly, kind of what Men Only Tayside does, but I wonder if there are things where there might be the option to partner with Scottish Trans or a similar group and kind of do a specific information session that's maybe for trans men. And, um, you know, one of the things that really came up in the report for trans men in particular was around PrEP dosing, um, which is different for, for, is generally different for trans men um, than cis men, things around condom use. So there can maybe be something around having sessions if you're having a sexual health session for example making sure that those issues were covered or you know if your potential audience was big enough maybe doing something specifically around that um i'm trying to think we didn't have a massive amount of participants from tayside and i, I can't remember if there's anything sort of specific to that health board um sorry oliver were you going to come in one person interviewed from dundee i'm not great on my geography i think that's near <laughs> <to> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so that's tayside um could i just so add I mean, at the moment, um, this is specific to THT. At the moment, we are talking to THT about a prep video. Um, I think that's Glasgow, not Tayside, of course, but I would be more than happy to talk to anybody from Tayside. Um, yeah. Um, but explicit marketing, it is all the stuff that was in the report. It's, it's just making, you know, one of the big hurdles anytime we go and do anything is just, are we welcome? So often that's the defining factor in whether we decide to go somewhere or not. Am I going to end up feeling worse than I did before I went because I've been made to feel horrible when I went? So that's the decision trans people make every time they choose to access something. And anything we can do to alleviate that um is better so you know i know as a trans person if i see a visible sign on somebody's website that that they are they're likely to use the correct pronoun that can make my day you know we're not um i think this is one of the big things as well one of the problems with specializing services like the gender clinics for example is it sends a signal that for some reason trans and non-binary people are really complicated and they need specialized services to look after them most of the time they don't you know, it, it also, it, it, it almost, it gives, it, it, it's too easy to say, oh, I can't deal with that because it's a, it's a gender problem. It needs to be dealt with with the gender clinic. When actual fact, it's probably not. It's probably something that's quite <laughs> normal to every single human being, but they just happen to be trans. So I think we have to, the fear factor goes both ways. It's not just trans people being frightened of working with whoever. It's whoever being frightened of working with trans people. And I don't think on either side there is any animosity there. It's just a, a um, yeah, just that horrible, unsure situation. And it's that that any front facing publicity or over messages of support will uh, help to alleviate. I think maybe just add, just haven't had a. Oh, sorry, Oliver, if you were going to just come in there. Yeah, I'm going to add. Um... It might be the same thing that you're going to say, but um, 
incorporating trans people in service design and delivery like this report has been done but but how many i don't know how many trans people work for thd or men only tay side but uh if trans people like just generally there's not there's not a huge amount of us so if people know that trans people are working at a service they know that there's a good chance that it's going to be trans friendly and um and these things kind of spread through a small community and people know that oh if this person works here so like it must be pretty good and um i think as so if it's been designed by trans people as well then it's going to be like you, you it's going to be better <laughs> um that's and that's part of the recommendations how is in like i managed to get them up um, but it, you know, working in partnership with trans advocacy organisations to deliver outreach, BBB and SCI testing, um, working in partnership with trans advocacy organisations and NHS services to deliver the information, sexual health information sessions for trans people, like funding to provide a community based sexual health service to trans people based on models of community based and peer delivered models of care, such as NIQ and various other community based models like like men who are sex with men and gay and by men services, they are community-based and often community-delivered. You can have the same thing for trans people. Um, it can be a specifically a, a bespoke service. Um, yeah, I think, what were you going to add, uh, Ruth? Just, I was going to make that exact point that, you know, if, I don't know, again, how sort of mainly t side functions, but if there's the option to get trans people involved in maybe even the design and delivery of a session and you know making sure that people can be paid to do that just to again to enable access and participation um, I think that could really help and just kind of stuff I mean st stuff that we put down actually probably more in the NHS sexual health services but if you know you're producing any resources trying to make sure they are as inclusive as possible if they relate to sexual health you know making sure that things are talked about in terms of anatomy and types of sex rather than um gender and sexual orientation being kind of used as code for different types of sex um are all things i suppose that are visible external signs that it's that it's a trans inclusive um group or service brilliant um thanks for those answers we've got a couple more questions um i'll try and go in order of who asked first and i'm sure we'll have enough time for them um so another question um so this, I suppose, possibly Ruth and Oliver one, but I think could be open to everybody. What would you do differently, if anything, if you were doing this research again? I have some thoughts on that. I just have one thought left over from the last question that I'd like to add to. Um, one of the things that I remember from an interview um, with someone in Tayside uh, in Dundee was that there's a lot, uh, a lot less out people outside the central belt. Like there's a lot more stealth trans people. So I guess any services with in areas that might be more stigmatizing of trans people, you have to think about do people want to be in a more private environment or like not visibly going to a service? Maybe remote service delivery is going to be more appropriate for like stealth people, but that's one to bear in mind as well. Um, is like who like what's the demographic and are they going to be proud of their identity or just living as they are and like maybe think consider themselves to have trans history um, in terms of what I do differently um, I still I feel slightly sad that we didn't manage to get more engagement from people outside the central belt we had a few people um, but it would have been nice to have more like more of a rural kind of perspective and potentially people who are living more stealth um, I think a good proportion or I don't know if we really recorded whether people were out and proud visibly trans like you know folk or if they were I consider myself to have a trans history and um, even the way that we designed the survey would have meant that you know you had to identify yourself as trans rather than like saying I have trans history I'm now just a person um, and yeah so I think there's a there's a broader amount of people we could have reached out to and I wonder how those folk who haven't engaged would have engaged with sexual health services. I think it would have been okay, like maybe it's our funding limitations and the way we're, the organisations we're working with, but more of a sex worker focus, more of a BAME focus. Um, it would have been nice to see what the challenges facing those groups. Um, and you know, we had engagement. We didn't specifically. Um, like aim at uh, sex workers, but we did have sex workers engage with us in the focus groups, which was really good. Um, so we got some good perspectives there, but uh, 
I would have liked to see more um, in those areas. How about you, Ruth? Um, yeah, I think I would kind of agree with everything you've said, Oliver. I think I would have, with more time, probably tried to make sure that we had more engagement with people in remote and rural areas and also with trans women and trans feminine people in the focus groups. I think the survey was was better distributed in terms of gender, but certainly the focus groups, I feel like trans women's perspectives were underrepresented there. So I think that's probably a limitation of the project. I, I, I do feel obliged to actually probably uh, mention the, the reasons for that. I know we have talked, we've all talked about this before, but if I could change one thing, it would be the climate in which we did the work. I think it was remarkable that as many people participated as they did. Uh, I think everybody should be very proud of that. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. There are lots of, uh, of communities that we didn't get to. Um, and part of that is because unfortunately, as a community, we don't have uh, we don't have those that strength of network. There are rural Scotland. Again, we touched on this and we could talk about this for hours, but um, finding support, finding other trans people, finding groups, finding anything in rural Scotland is very, very difficult. Um, and without those groups, uh, trying to reach those people becomes impossible. Um, so in a, in a wider term and from a Scottish trans perspective, we try and support those networks. We try and grow those networks so people can talk to each other, people can um, and do know where to go. But I think that, that will be the thing, it is. I think we're all saying the same thing. It's a wider reach. We would have liked to talk to more people. I think I think you're right in that the climate that we were doing this under meant that there were a lot of fatigued trans people who were too exhausted to engage in research and like sometimes I think a lot of people were like this is a great time to talk about something other than the Gender Recognition Act um, but yeah there was a number of people who were like that. And I do have to say that trans women are being forced out of public life at the moment uh, that's very much how it feels like as somebody who presents in a vaguely feminine way even though I'm a non-binary person um, getting out and about for us is becoming ever more difficult um, and it was certainly the case when we were doing this um, so yeah that that may have influenced the amount of uh, I mean of course had we done this now there would have been far more focus groups would probably have shifted online which would have shifted probably the whole group that's all the groups that we got it would have changed things dramatically so obviously these all the all these things get factored in don't they? so in retrospect um maybe we could have done all sorts of other things but i think we did a fantastic job brilliant thank you um we'll go to this question now so it's from Ingrid, who says, great presentation. It's great to hear this research and learn through your collaborations and peer research efforts. I entirely agree that the existing clinical eligibility is very binary. I think that those of us involved recognize their downfall. But apart from making the criteria more inclusive, which is needed, were there other experiences within clinics, like discussing other medications, living with other illnesses, that were barriers to engaging with PrEP? I can maybe come in on that first. Um, thinking back, I don't think there was anything specifically around either living with other illnesses or discussing other medications. I know that I think there was one person in the survey who'd <clears throat> tried to access PrEP and had kind of gone through the process but hadn't, hadn't ultimately been prescribed it because of a contraindication with other medication. But I think that's probably true. You know, that'll happen to a proportion of people across the board trying to access PrEP. Um, I think in terms of the issues more widely than the criteria, I think just knowing PrEP existed was probably one of the main ones. Um, kind of worryingly in the survey of the people who said that they would be eligible for PrEP, um, which I think was around 29 people, only five had actually tried to access it. So there's quite a significant proportion of people who seemed to report that PrEP would, you know, they would meet the existing eligibility criteria, even as they are, but weren't accessing PrEP. Um, 
and certainly a, quite a significant swathe of them said that was just because they didn't know about it or it was never something that had been marketed to them. So I think the criteria, yeah, is one issue, but it's definitely not going to, you know, I think Ingrid's point that it, it's absolutely not, you know, going to solve the problem. Um, I think there's a wider issue of needing to make sure that PrEP's marketed to trans people um, and is marketed in a way that's trans inclusive. I think there's just a bigger hurdle also, which is that PrEP is almost like a a micro representation of the bigger issues that people have access and services so if people aren't engaging with services in the first place they're maybe not having conversations about the kind of sex they're having and maybe whether they're at risk of HIV and therefore whether PrEP would be right for them so PrEP's almost a kind of I think symptom of a of maybe a bigger issue with people's access to sexual health services and if people had better access to services or felt more comfortable accessing services and being open about um, the sex they were having then I think that would um, help with with wider access to PrEP um, you know because I think there particularly where we had maybe what was more often the case than people talking about um, different conditions or barriers was was talking about different forms of marginalization so I think we had one person who was a sex worker and, and just explained that their experience of access and services they felt kind of marginalized on so many different levels and so many different ways that um, that you know they just faced a lot of you know being trans was one thing but there were also lots of other aspects of their identity um and their day-to-day -day life that meant engaging with services was extremely difficult um so you know i think the nature of prep is such that it, it it's for people who are most at risk of, of hiv and and by nature that's probably people who are going to be sort of potentially marginalized in, in other ways so there's almost that kind of layering um of barriers to engaging with sexual health services in the first place which then I think means that people are going to struggle to also access PrEP, um, if that makes sense. I think, yeah, that would I'd add to that in that the, that like layering in the barriers just makes people so exhausted. They don't want to bother taking care of themselves in that way or like finding out like, oh, should, could I get it? And, and even, you know, on top of the inclusion criteria, um, that does just mean that they're like, oh, I don't even want to ask whether it's something I could access. Um, I'd say that generally the biggest barrier would be awareness um, like in cis het friends people don't seem to know prep is a thing and a lot of some of the time when people transition they they transition from that population into being trans gay people and they still aren't aware that prep is a thing and so it perpetuates this whole like oh I didn't know that I was in our survey you know did indicate that that was you know people realize they're eligible and through the survey rather than um from having media marketed to them uh, yeah brilliant thank you i think we've maybe got one time for one more question um and we've got some good questions i might be just be picky but i'll choose this one here um from blue hey great session so far i Work with the, I work with the Sex Worker Wellbeing Charity Umbrella Lane, and we do have some trans people that connect with us, but I'm curious how welcoming other trans spaces are to sex workers. Do you notice any increased stigma? I'll go to whoever feels like that. I'm happy to answer. Oh. I'd say uh, in terms of like organisations that support um, trans people and their sexual health, um, sometimes the there isn't like I'm talking about SX here, but there's difficulty with explicit like naming like we support sex workers because of the um, funding issues around like and like where the government funding comes from that you can't name stuff like that, which is really a difficult position. Um, but they are sex worker inclusive and support sex workers. Um, in trans spaces that are community spaces, um, I haven't noticed any stigma, increased stigma, but I also am not a sex worker, so can't speak to that experience. Um, in terms of like the spaces I inhabit, uh, which is a lot of DIY culture and um, like smaller anarchist movements, uh, yes, it's very sex worker inclusive, but that's kind of in the nature of those spaces. Um, and they might not necessarily be just trans spaces like, you know, Lighthouse Bookshop is for everybody, but um, you know, unless you're a fascist. Uh, but anyway, going a bit off track here. Um, yeah, I don't, but I I don't know if I'm in the space. I'm not in the spaces that might people might want to access. Um, but yeah, I think it's those like difficulties with government funding kind of 
strictness that makes it harder to be more publicly out about supporting sex workers. Oshana, do you have any comments? Um, I mean, obviously, as a, back to what I said at the beginning, um, uh, we are not specialists in this sector. Um, I certainly, from all of my dealings with the trans community, have, have not uh, noticed any change in how the community feels about sex work and sex workers. I certainly haven't. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's been a particular deterioration. I mean, it's, it's sadly true, of course, that um, as always, they are on the sharp end, but I have no, um, I have no hands-on experience or knowledge of this. I can probably add, actually, I used to be one of the committee for trans masculine Scotland, which was very much, um, although perhaps not explicitly like saying it all the time, but sex work inclusive for sure. Uh, and yeah, I think it's possibly just one of those things that's not so much spoken about in trans only spaces, but um, the occasional time it's mentioned, yeah, it's very much not, I don't, I've not noticed stigma against it. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. And we're going to have to wrap up the session. There are a couple of outstanding questions, but unfortunately we didn't have time to get around to them. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Oshana, Oliver and Ruth. Um, and there's been some good chat going on in the chat box. And um, as ever, I'm sure all three would be glad to um, to answer more questions down the line um, if you can find them. Um, but for now, I want to say thank you for everyone who attended, who submitted a question and who um, yeah, was here to listen, and I hope you're going to join in more sessions at the Fast Tracking Scotland Summit. So thank you once again.